Good evening, everybody. And uh, bienvenue, Monsieur Tata, on campus here at HEC Paris. My name is Simon Pierre Sangerac. I'm a Grande Ecole student, and I'm also the vice president of HEC Debat, which is a student run organization that organizes debates and conferences here on campus. And I'll be your host tonight. And it is a great honor and an even greater pleasure for me to welcome with my fellow colleagues of the MBA Student Council, Mr. Tata here on campus. Thank you very much. And right now, I welcome on stage the dean among the deans, Mr. Bernard Ramonansu. <laughs> Thank you for this introduction. Uh, dear special guest, Mr. Ratan Tata, Your Excellency, Monsieur l'Ambassadeur, uh, dear Chairman, Vice President of the Chamber of Commerce, dear Jean-Paul, dear Mireille, President of the HEC Alumni, uh, dear Mr. Hanant, Chair of the HEC Alumni Indian Chapter, Dear faculty members, my dear colleagues, dear students, ladies and gentlemen, despite the 10,000 kilometers which separate Bombay and Paris, you accepted, Mr. Tata, the invitation that Sumit Hanand, chair of the HEC alumni chapter in India, gave you one year ago. That day, in the presence of Laurent Fabius, the French Minister of Foreign Affairs, the HEC community in India invited you to come to jouy en josas to receive the HEC Honoris Causa degree and to share your experience with our students and our faculty. You even accepted to postpone a trip to New York to be with us tonight. Thank you very, very much for the sign of friendship which actually, truly honors us. As the Dean of HEC Paris, I'm proud to welcome you on campus, Mr. Tata. In the galaxy of international corporate leaders, you are an icon and famous all over the world. You were chairman of Tata Group for more than 20 years, and you are an example to us, to us all, an example of humility, of entrepreneurship, of innovative spirit, and of commitment to your country and to the world. These four values are also shared by us here at HEC Paris. Indeed, and that's a very important point, beyond your success in business, it is this, if I may, Tata way of doing business by respecting universal human values that HEC Paris is celebrating today in presenting you with this honoris causa degree. Before letting our students, Megan, Panuteja, and Simon Pierre introduce you in more detail, I would like to thank the audience for being here that they have gathered each in such great number to listen to you and learn from your experience is, of course, not a surprise. You are one of the most successful and innovative CEOs in the world, leading a group of more than 500,000 employees. And as you probably know, HEC is famous for its many alumni who are CEOs of Fortune 500 companies and your presence among us today is, is, is consistent with our core mission. But beyond this fascination of business school students for successful C CEOs, your presence here today is an acknowledgement of the strong links and friendship between HEC Paris and India. Firstly, HEC Paris has recruited students and professors in India since 1982. Today, three professors and 150 students have come to HEC Paris from India across all of our degree programs. The Grand Ecole and Master's program, the MBA, the Executive MBAs, and the PhD program. 
Moreover, HEC Paris has signed partnership agreements with the most prestigious Indian business schools, three of the best IIMs, Indian Institute of Management, Ahmedabad, Bangalore, and Calcutta, as well as the Indian School of Business, ISB. I would like to highlight, in particular, our double degree between the HEC Master in Management and the IIM Ahmedabad PGP program, signed in 2010, which we are very proud of. Beyond these academic partnerships, HEC Paris has always had close links with leading international companies operating both in India and in Europe, such as Infosys, Indian Railways, TCS, and of course, and of course, Tata Group. Cooperation between HEC Paris and Tata Consulting Services started in 2009 with recruitment of HEC graduates and interns with Tata participants in the HEC MBA program and with the, the development of close links between the representatives of our two institutions, thanks to the strong support of the Embassy. Thank you very much, Monsieur l'Ambassadeur, for your constant commitment to the relationship between Tata Group and HEC Paris. This long-standing collaboration will be further reinforced by the strategic decisions on education that were taken only two weeks ago during the official visit to France by the Prime Minister of India, Mr. Narendra Modi. In fact, expressing a mutual interest in boosting the number and quality of student exchanges, the Indian Prime Minister and President Hollande, who is, you remember, an HEC alumnus who graduated 40 years ago exactly, invited educational institutions from both countries to further expand their co collaboration in line with the needs of industry. Mr. Tata, thank you very, very much for accepting this Honora Cosa degree from HEC Paris. We are honored to award you this distinction, joining the likes of Jeffrey Imel, the CEO of GE, Samuel Palmisano, the former CEO of IBM, Maria, Mikhail Gorbachev and Bill Gates. We are very, very honored to have you with us and we are looking forward to this exclusive exchange with our students. Thank you very, very much. Thank you, Dean. And now without further ado, Megan and Banu, President and Vice President of the MBA Student Council, will introduce you, Mr. Tata, and then ask you a few questions. Thank you very much. Good evening, everyone. Mr. Ratan Tata is the kind of man who needs no introduction. He is one of those rare business legends whose legacy becomes clearer and deeper with every passing year. We know him most as the former chairman of Tata Group, India's largest multinational conglomerate, founded by his great-grandfather, Jamshedji Tata, in 1868. The Tata Group touches nearly every business sector you can imagine. IT, communications, industrial materials, hospitality, finance, energy, chemicals, and automotive. He is the man who had a dream to create the people's car of India, the world's cheapest car. He did this in 2008 when he launched the Tata Nano that was manufactured for less than 1,500 euros. As a young man, Ratan Tata moved to the US, studying architecture and structure, structural engineering at Cornell University. After graduating and at the advice of family, he refused a job offer from IBM and decided to return to India in 1962. That decision would be one of the most defining in his life. He began working in the family business first getting his hands dirty, literally working at a steel plant at Tata Steel. He would return to the US in the 1970s to complete the advanced management program at the other business schools that begins with a H, and you may have heard of Harvard. <laughs> Later, 
As chairman of Tata Industries in the 1980s, he was bold and unwavering in his recommendation to venture into high-tech businesses, focus on select markets and products, mergers and acquisitions, and leveraging group synergies. He would become the chairman of Tata Group in 1991, filling the shoes of his uncle, Mr. J.R.D. Tata. Reflecting on that appointment, Mr. Ratan Tata said, suddenly you feel all alone. His vision would come to life in the first decade of the 21st century, perhaps among the most glorious of the company's history, when he, saw the, when he oversaw the acquisition of 22 companies worldwide, including Tetley T, Cora Steel, New York's Pierre Hotel, and Jaguar Land Rover, for a total of $18 billion spent. Without Ratan Tata, it is almost certain that Tata Group would not be where it is today on the global business map. Half a million employees worldwide, 100 operating companies, 36 of which are publicly listed, spread across 56 countries in six continents. More than 65% of the group's income today comes from overseas operations. Ratan Tata is a shy person, he says. He enjoys swimming and at one point was an avid and regular scuba diver. Cars and planes are his biggest and perhaps only indulgences. He is an accomplished pilot and flies both planes and helicopters. He serves on the program board of the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation's India AIDS Initiative. He is a member of the board of trustees of the University of Southern California and the Harvard Business School Board of Dean's Advisors, the X Prize, and Cornell University. Perhaps one day, a small and humble business school in France could be added to that very exclusive list of where he chooses to make his mark. On legacy, he has said, apart from values and ethics, which I have tried to live by, the legacy that I would like to leave behind is a very simple one, that I have always stood up for what I consider to be the right thing, and I have tried to be as fair and equitable as I could be. We are honored to have you here with us tonight, Mr. Tata, and on behalf of the HSC Paris community, I'd like to extend a very warm welcome. Many in our audience might have been surprised to hear that when you returned to India as a young man, you started on the shop floor at Tata Steel. I wondered if you could share with us a few lessons that you learned at that time. Um, I was on the shop floor for about two or three years. Uh, and during those two or three years, I. I thought this was an absolute waste of time and it served absolutely no purpose. Um, I was very wrong because I learned a lot in those three years. Um, perhaps what I learned best was the question of humility amongst, amongst people because Standing shoulder to shoulder with workers for three years uh, and being given no special uh, privileges, I learned to I learned what the other larger segment of our workforce did like, how they reacted, and and. Uh, very emotionally, when I became chairman of Tata Steel in 91, several of the workers came up to me and said, do you remember I was in the blast furnace with you, or I, I taught you how to read temperatures or whatever? And not many chairmen have that privilege of, of being friendly with someone who you 
could call by their first name or they could call you by their first name. So I learned a lot. And sorry, long answer to your question. Not at all. Thank you. So, uh, so here at HEC Paris, we have a lot of emphasis on leadership. And uh, it is also evident in the fact that we produce a large number of CEOs. So uh, do you believe the leaders, leaders are born or can leadership be taught in classrooms? That's a difficult question to answer. Um, because I don't think there is a, a one answer to, to that. I think both things of what you said are true. That there's some people who are born leaders and some who who shine as leaders because a circumstance or a, or a predicament takes place and someone who's shy and almost retiring suddenly suddenly begins to shine and be, takes on leadership positions. So I don't think there's a, a single answer to that. Thank you. Um. You've said before, if I can just turn a little bit to, to decision making for a second, you've said before that I don't believe in taking right decisions, I take decisions and then I make them right. Um, how did you come to build that philosophy? I'm sorry, I'm going to upset you, but <laughs> Facebook or Twitter that, that made that statement, it was never made by me. That's not you. <laughs> well, that's awkward. Uh, <laughs> And so, so it's been a default statement. You, you come to know of it when people read them back to you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and um, there's no remedial action that you can take with the social media. True. Uh, and, and so you live with it. Some people think it's arrogant for you to have state, stated that and you don't have a chance to defend yourself by saying you never did. And some people think it's a great thing to say and you quietly keep quiet. <laughs> so. <laughs> maybe instead then what I could ask is, is generally speaking, um, you know, maybe a very important decision that you had to make um, throughout your, your long and tenured career that, that you can share with us. And, um, maybe more generally your decision-making philosophy then. And we'll have a new Twitter quote. <laughs> I'll try not to make this as long an answer as the first time. Uh, maybe, maybe two instances uh, were stand out in my mind as, as being uh, instances that had a bearing on being right or wrong as the case might be. The first that comes to mind is we, we developed, as you know, a small car called the Nano. We decided that we would establish the factory in Calcutta because industry had moved away from the eastern part of India. And we thought a revolutionary car could be in a place that brought employment back to eastern India. We unfortunately got um, embroiled in a political battle between the, the government of West Bengal and an aspiring leader, political leader, a lady, who vowed that she would not allow a single car to come out of this factory. And the war of words went on between her and me. The factory was almost 85% complete and I had to take a decision that given the fact that we had dead bodies thrown on the site, we had shootings, we had people beaten up that I couldn't look at our employees in their eye and say that you'll work in this factory. So we decided or I decided that we would move. And we decided that in the dead of night. And we started moving a completed car plant over the next 
several days, I think with about 1,400 large tractor trailer trucks, we moved the plant out and ended up in Gujarat, which is Mr. Modi's uh, state. Uh, we lost a lot in that period of one year where we rebuilt that plant. To this day, one will never know whether we did the right thing or not. Uh, I personally believe that that was the only option we had, but it became a very ugly decision that had to be taken. The, the second, um, if you might challenge that I faced completely different was when 10 Pakistani terrorists descended on Bombay and, and uh, amongst the places they attacked, they attacked our hotel. And um, about <clears throat> 37 or 40 people in our hotel were, were shot and killed for no reason. And then it became an issue that do you stand by and let this happen or do you go into the midst of what was like a war zone and stand with your employees and, and go to their, the homes of people who, who were killed and, and we, I chose to do the latter to go every day to the hospitals to to uh, to look at the people who were injured, and there again, that leaves a lasting impression on you in terms of what happened, what could have been done to avoid it, and how could you deal with this? What was the best form of support you could give to your people? I think. Uh, those two instances stand out as being challenging moments in, in uh, one's career. It's certainly not easy. Uh, so um, in terms of Europe, uh, we see that Tata Group has a lot of investments in Europe and uh, it's, it's a big player for the Tata Group portfolio. How do you see Europe's future business potential? Well, I've, I've always felt that Europe is um, a union of, of nations that has a tremendous potential. It's a huge market. It's, it's also a union of countries that is going through a difficult economic period of time at this point in time, partly because of current common currency and partly because each of the countries are not of the same economic status. I can only say that I hope that the European Union is able to come out of this and, and revert back to the prosperity that the founding fathers of the EU had hoped and that it takes its place in the world as an important economic power. Thank you. Um, just to maybe bounce off of that question, um, a key strategy over the past decade uh, for the for the group has been inorganic growth through acquisitions. Sorry, uh, sorry I, um, a key strategy over the past decade for the group has been through acquisitions. Um, what prompted this specific strategy? And I'm I'm thinking of a couple of particular brands overseas, both Tetley and Jaguar Land Rover. Tetley, I, I think, <clears throat> was motivated by the fact that we had the second largest tea garden and tea activity in India, and, and Tetley was an opportunity to get an international brand. Uh, the two other major acquisitions, I, Jaguar Land Rover and Chorus, in each case, the companies came to us and asked whether we couldn't get together. And on looking at them, we felt that they, they fulfilled important strategic gaps that we had in either the 
geography we operated in or the product areas or technology that we had, which made us go forward. It was not, contrary to most people's view, an issue of just getting bigger. Do you think that that's a strategy um, that's sustainable for the future of Tata Group, as far as acquisitions? Well, I think there was a strategy in, in each of the acquisitions. It wasn't just um, a shopping spree, as, as some of the media has referred to it. And uh, I, I think the only one that is in has gone through a great deal of difficulty has been Chorus, which has been <clears throat> as much an issue of the economic situation in Europe is, as, uh, as much as one could blame the concerned company that we acquired. It's the steel industry in Europe itself has been going through a very difficult period. And we have been hit by that rather badly. Uh, as I said, I hope Europe recovers and, and in that case, one would find the, that it would be in, an investment that was uh, strategic in, in value. Mm, that segues actually very nicely into my next question. Um, it's about Jaguar Land Rover and JLR being a household brand in the UK and a very common name in Great Britain. So when you acquired that, when Tata Group acquired, how do you deal with it in terms of culture, especially integrating that into your portfolio? First of all, there was, uh, there was a, a great deal of misunderstanding uh, in the UK, there were P and this permeated into the workforce also. There was a feeling that that this was a, a ploy for an Indian company to buy Jaguar Land Rover, close down the plants in England, move move the factories to India, and make Birmingham into a real estate project or a set of, I'm saying this not facetiously because it was said to me, uh, of tandoori chicken restaurants in, in the Midlands. <laughs> and I had to stand in front of the workers and assure them that A, Tata's were not in the r restaurant business. We may have some <laughs> hotels, but we didn't have a chain of restaurants and that was not our intention. It was also not our intention to saddle JLR with cheap uh, cars from India. And then what we said, which is what we tried to do, was to say our plan is to leave you alone to support you and work with you in, in returning these two brands to their original glory. What's gratifying is that the workforce in JLR did exactly that. They, they with pride, worked towards making the car, uh, the car company closer to what it was in the days of its heyday. And I think they've done admirably well, and the management of JLR, I think, are really the heroes of, of the day. Thank you. So certainly during your time, you, you saw a lot of change and, and ushered in a lot of change at the Tata Group. Um, we know that it's a company steeped in history. It has certain ways of working. Um, t if you can take us back a little bit to that moment when you became chairman, how hard was it for you to create a culture of positive change? <laughs> my, my first few years in, as chairman, uh, was committed and dedicated to changing the culture in, in the company. I inherited a board, for example, that must have been, have an average age of 85. Uh, we, had, we had a few directors who 
were participating, several of them had to be helped into the boardroom because they could no <laughs> longer walk freely. Some of them came and sat down and fell asleep. <laughs> Others didn't hear too well. But when it came to making changes, they all woke up <laughs> and, and ensured that no change took place. <laughs> so the first four or five years were spent in trying to figure out how to graciously ease them out of the company. <laughs> and finally, uh, I'm pleased to say that most of them followed a trend of, if you made them an offer that was attractive enough, they, they agreed to move. And then five years later, one could sit down and try to create a new, a new culture, a company that, a group that was more customer oriented and attempted to be more nimble footed than it had been in the past. So, Mr. Tata, my next question is about that time in your life when you became the chairman of the Tata Group. Uh, you said something that is that stands out even today, that you felt all alone at the top. Sorry? That you felt all alone when you were the chairman of the Tata Group. And uh, the fact that most of us will probably be leaders in the future, what can we expect? <laughs> oh, I think there are many moments uh, that most CEOs or chairman feel that they're alone. Uh, it's, it's almost an occupational hazard that, that you live with, uh, where you either can't confide because it's not appropriate, or you stand alone against a tide of views or pushes where you don't, don't feel that you need to be compromised. Um, there was a time uh, when one felt that the fabric of India, and the ethical fabric of India was being eroded. And uh, most companies, including ours, uh, had to face uh, an issue of, of dealing with this by participating in subjective activities, be they doing favors for people or, or actually uh, paying. And the few times that, that we were approached and stood our ground and did not uh, do that made me go home at night with this wonderful feeling that we didn't succumb. And anybody that says that you can't operate in India without paying I think needs to, needs to look at us as an example because we grew and we grew from about 5 billion to 100 billion without participating in anything subjective. So industry can grow in India and you don't need to succumb. And uh, I think that's, that's the one thing I would say that it was probably the loneliest moment or set of moments that one has and one feels pleased that you were able to, to go through that period and not compromise your, your ideals. Uh, thank you, Mr. Tata. I think uh, that is a very clear embodiment. I think that's a very clear embodiment of the Tata way of doing business. Sorry? I think that's a very clear embodiment of the Tata way of doing business. As an organization um, gets larger, the institution sometimes becomes more important than the inspiration. In the 21st century, what role do you think leaders play in keeping that inspiration alive? at large what companies, generally speaking, leaders in the 21st century. How, how, how can they keep that inspiration alive? How did you maybe help to keep that inspiration alive at Tata Group? How do they? 
keep inspiration oh. when a company becomes so big? I, I think it's a greater challenge as the company grows bigger, but you, you understand that everybody in a large organization gets further and further from getting the feeling that they're adding value and they feel that they're little ants in, a, in an anthill. So it becomes, a, it becomes the job of the CEO to inspire the people and communicate with them and, and deal with them in a manner that, that they understand. Uh, how well you do it or how poorly you do it, you find out after the event. So I, I think all, all large organizations that are successful uh, have CEOs that go out of their way to communicate with their employees because the greatest asset they have are their employees and dissatisfied employees or ignored employees are unhappy employees and they don't give you the best. So I think most successful CEOs give a lot of their attention and time to doing this and, and to paying particular attention to the needs of their employees. So, and we tried to do the same. Of course. Yeah. So, Mr. Tata, um, talking of inspiration, um, I'm sure you're a great inspiration to a lot of us here, and uh, personally for me as well. So, uh, if I can ask, uh, was there someone who inspired you when you were growing up as a young boy in India? Uh, yes. Uh, I think Mr. J.R.D. Tata, who, who was my predecessor, played a very important role in... in uh, in being a mentor to me. Um, the day he handed over to me, which is a little bit surprising, uh, I was terrified because he was staying on in the office and, and I thought he would continue to run the group uh, from where he was. I was truly terrified. I, I thought this was going to be a hypocritical handover. What it actually turned out to be was he, he gave me most of my inspiration, most of my, the support I needed in those early days. Most of the advice that I received came from him. And I don't know what would have happened in those first two or three years while he was there, had he not been there. So yes, he was probably my greatest inspiration and greatest role model that, that I had, and I was very lucky to have him. Thank you. This um, is like Wimbledon. <laughs> <laughs> It does feel that way, a little bit. Thank you for playing along, by the way. We're, we're th um, maybe I, I'd like to include then the audience in this back and forth a little bit more um, by talking about advice that you um, might give to young graduates. And I'm thinking specifically on balancing humility with the desire to be proud and bold. I think both those attributes are, are important. I don't think you can make them up or, or uh, act that without having those feelings within you, those emotions with, within you. And uh, I don't think you can teach that or you can force that to happen. I, th I think it depends on each each person, many, many of the people in this room who are students today would find themselves in leadership positions uh, in the near future. 
and they have to define their own styles in as natural a way as they can. But they need humility because without that, it's very diff difficult to, in today's world, to be a good autocratic or dictatorial leader. Uh, and it's much more expected that you would be a humble, uh, communicative leader to lead your organization and your employees in a particular way. So all I can say is that this is to be an attribute that comes from within the people that are going to go out into industry, and I hope they the education that they receive here will give them both humility and and a, and a sense of innovativeness and some balance of both things. <laughs> Your serve. Your my, serve. My serve. <laughs> so, uh, in the last 20 years, you've seen India grow a lot, and. Uh, there's been constant growth in the last 20 years when you were chairman of the Tata Group. How, how confident are you about the prospects of India in the business potential uh, today and in the future? How confident and what are the, how do you see India's future in terms of business? Economically or politically? Economically. Or? Well, let, let me just say that I've always been very upbeat about the prospects and, and potential of India. We're a country of over a billion people, uh, getting to be larger in terms of the consuming uh, segment. Uh, roughly 250 to 300 million people who are consumers, about the size of the United States. And, and the segment that's becoming prosperous is growing every year from, from below. We have a new government, as everyone knows, uh, a very active prime minister who is convinced that he can give India the impetus and the momentum that, uh, that it needs to take its place amongst the economic countries in the world. And I think he has been energetically going about uh, repairing the relations with it, India's neighbors. On He has been uh, giving hope and aspirations to millions of Indians. And we're all very hopeful that this is going to be, work out to be a new India which is uh, emerging. Some words of caution are that the aspirations of everyone in India are very high. And uh, maybe sometimes unrealistically high because a country of a billion people is it's very difficult to change overnight. And there could be levels of disillusionment amongst the people, which I think those of us who could be opinion makers should urge the people of India to stand with the new government and help make India the country that it could be. But it very realistically may fall short of them despite everybody's best in, endeavors because of its size and because of its traditions and because of its greatest enemy, which is vested interests that seem to govern in India at any one time. So uh, just, to, just to follow up on that, um, what do you think is the role of the government in, in keeping growth constant and keeping it going? Sorry. What is the role of the government in encouraging a, or creating a positive business climate in India? Well, I think if I could quote Mr. Modi, he has talked about 
more governance and less government. Uh, we have been over-governed and overruled and uh, over-managed politically. And I, I think it would be uh, a wonderful thing in India if we were to open up India even more than it was and let free market forces apply and let government uh, simplify its, its governmental role and the role of government be more supportive than regulatory, which I think Mr. Modi is committed to do. Thank you. I'll turn it over then just to... Um... <laughs> Sorry to make you. <laughs> not at all, not at all. Um, you're now retired, um, and yet, as we mentioned in our intro, you're still very active, both in India and abroad. Can you share with us how you plan to fill the, that luxury of time in the coming years that you have? That much time, too? H how do you plan to fill your time in the coming years? if you can share a little bit with us. Well, I, I expected and, and planned to spend my time, and I have been doing that by and large, to combat malnutrition in children and mothers in, in India in the rural areas. We lose a disproportionately high number of infants due to malnutrition and they have physical and mental deformities due to malnutrition. And the view I had was that this was an area that one could make a difference. It's proven to be a much bigger issue. It involves areas that I had not expected, namely sanitation and health and such, which holistically have to be examined and dealt with. So one of the main areas of my time is being spent in, in trying to address this and bring technology to, to play. I'm working with other philanthropic institutions like the Gates Foundation and, and some of the UN agencies to make this happen. And there are a lot of other little things that, that one is doing, but I'm certainly not idle and I'm very pleased that I'm still busy. Of course, thank you. Uh, that's it, Mr. Ratan Tata. So that's the end of the match, and I'd like to say. <laughs> I think now we wanted to open it up yeah. to some audience questions, okay. of course. Thank you, Mr. Tata.